Hey, it's Matt Pinfield here for Trust Records, and the vinyl reissue of The Crew from 1984 is coming out, and we're so excited about it, and I'm sitting down right now with Kevin Seconds from 7 Seconds. Kevin, it's so great to see you. You too, man. You, you of course, started out in Sacramento, and then you guys ended up moving to Reno, yep. which uh, you call Skino, of course. And uh, tell me about learning to play the guitar, and then your brother Steve, of course, playing mm -hmm. bass. Um, yeah, uh, we just, you know, we, we grew up listening to like a lot of the big hard rock bands, you know, and um, I loved all that stuff. We had the posters on the wall. We listened, you know, sit and daydream in our room, but it, I, I never had a, it always, it was very untouchable to me, you know, like whatever you'd hear, say Jimmy Page or Richie Blackmore or Ronnie Montrose, like that was stuff that I thought I could, I'd never, I'll never be able to do this. This isn't like, you know, so it didn't seem attainable, but I wanted to be in a band. I wanted to be a rock and roller, you know. Uh, when we moved to Reno, um, you know, we were just living, at one point we were living out of a car, we just didn't have, a, there was not a lot of hope and there was not a lot of access. We I mean, certainly weren't shows you could go to. And we and so we listened to a lot of the radio, but um, somehow we, we've heard about this punk rock phenomenon going on in England and, and New York and it just, I don't know, there's something intriguing about it. It seemed like it was geared towards young people. It seemed like it was sort of re you know, reaching out to people, that, kids that were less fortunate. And um, it, there were, you know, bands like The Clash were encouraging kids to pick up guitar. And, and I just got the bug. You know, once I got the bug, I, I just was, you know, kind of pulling my little tag along brother with me and saying, heck, you know, you, you play bass. <laughs> Try to get our sister to play drums, but she was, she, she wasn't happening. <laughs> she wanted to be, she wanted to sing and play guitar too. But it's so cool that the whole family, like all yeah. the kids were really into music, you know, like, yeah, you know, yeah. from listening to things like T-Rex at home and like you mentioned Montrose, to all of a sudden, the minute you discovered punk rock, talk to yeah. me about that, because there was a record store, right, where you went and got the damn Generation X and things like yeah. that. Yeah, well, like initial, no, initially nobody carried punk rock stuff, and there was a one record store in town that, that started to carry little uh, imported vinyl, uh, seven inches, and, and uh, I'd go over there and check it out, and I worked at McDonald's. I'd give my mom a little money to help with rent, and then everything else just went to records. I'd just buy nothing but records, you know. And, and uh, that lasted for years, and then finally I was just like, you know, maybe I should start thinking about buying a car or something, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about when you guys decided to start a band, when you were, you know, making some of those early cassettes. There wasn't really a scene at first, and, and we just kept hearing about, I, I'd, find, I'd get these zines out of LA, um, Panic, and later on Flipside, and San Francisco had some really cool zines, Damage and stuff, and it just, it they, they uh, covered what they, they just started using the term, this, you know, being part of a scene. And I thought, I, I think, I think I just felt like uh, at that point, I, I, I didn't belong to any, you know, I, I was kind of an outsider. I didn't really have a lot of friends. I wasn't like popular. I wasn't a jock. I wasn't a stoner, really. I just didn't have a place to fit, but I kind of wanted to. I wanted community is what I wanted. And so um, I'd hear about this stuff and I'm like, well, you know, let's, let's, we got to figure out how to get. There's got to be more people. There, there have to be more people in this town than us that like this music, you know. Um, and Rocky Horror Picture Show was kind of the, kind of the, where all the freaks would go on the weekends. And, and so we, midnight showings. Yeah, yeah, midnight shows. You go there, and it, it, you know, I loved the movie. It was great, but it was really for me. It was just seeing this other side of Reno that you just didn't see every day on the streets. You just saw these people cut loose, and they were, some people had blue in their hair, and it was like, I think these are people. I don't know why, but I think this is what you know. And um, so yeah, we just, that kind of stuff. And then the Ramones came through, at the end of 78, they opened for Eddie Money. And they came and played at this, the fairgrounds the pavilion building. And I, I lost my mind. I, I just couldn't believe, I, I really every day just kept expecting to hear like, well, they've canceled the show, you know? And I was like, just don't cancel, you know? I paid $6 for this ticket, I don't know. And uh, that day of the Ramones, I remember standing in line and the first probably 20 people that were in line, I just assumed it was like Eddie Money fans. I, I just fought to get to the front of the line and it turned out that everybody in the front of the line were all Ramones fans. And we all started talking and we were like, you're here for the Ramones? And it was like, not just kids from Reno, but kids from Carson City, Lake Tahoe, you know, who'd come to, the, to Reno for the show. And we were just all excited to meet each other, to know that we loved the, this music and uh, got there. And, and it was just, that, that sort of kick-started this idea that there were a bunch of us and we just needed to fi find a way to come together. and. I had no idea. We didn't. We didn't know how to put on shows. We didn't know if, if you could put on shows. We didn't know a lot. We didn't know anybody outside of Reno. Um, so seven seconds when we first started to play, we we played in these basement shows and. 
invite some of the girls from Rocky Horror Picture Show and their friends and they'd show up and then it just was a, kind of an organic little scene. You know, there was 20 and then there was 40 and then there was 50 and then, you know, all of a sudden it was like we, we started getting a bit that band DOA from Canada, you know, they were always touring and we heard that they were touring and we reached out and wrote a letter and said, would you play Reno? And thinking that they'd just blow us off and they said, sure, you know, can you pay us 250 bucks? And we're like, sure, not knowing if we could pay them anything. Yeah, right. And once they, once DOA came through, they were, they knew all the Black Flag guys, they knew Dick Kennedy's, they opened that door to us for us to be able to get those bands into town and then as Seven Seconds was starting out, we'd always be the opening band because we were one of the few bands we were playing and um, those bands just adopted, they liked us and they'd invite us to come play and that's how, kind of how it all worked out, you know, it became like a, a little network, you know, yeah. or we became part of that little network, I guess. And, it's amazing, you, you know. And I know that it was kind of hard to tour when you were young because you, you know, you guys were poor. You didn't have a lot of money. And, yeah. But I want to talk about how you know L.A. kind of became your second home mm -hmm. for the band Seven Seconds and a place yeah. there because all the people ended up loving you there. And even when you're at the Boston playing with the FUs and some of the other sure. bands that were part yeah. of that. All of a sudden, people writing us and asking us, you know, if we're going to tour and inviting us to play in Chicago and Texas and. Yeah, all of a sudden we were, we realized, oh, so maybe this is going to be what we're doing for a while, and you know, this this is good. So, but yeah, it was all you know. There's no, it was all seat of the pants and and no real idea. There was no, we were just talking. This, there was no handbook. There was no yeah. like rules where you could just go. All right, so nowadays I, you could just get on the internet and figure out how to. <laughs> Back then it was like the same thing. It's like you know, if you had an app, atlas or one of those maps that you would uh, yep, look at yeah. and try to find the venue that, that you were going now. to. <laughs> Yeah, right. So, talk about meeting the Stern Brothers and, and BYO and how that went down. Well, we were gonna. Uh, so we did the seven inch, the Skins Break test. We did the second seven inch, and then we wanted to do a full length album. And we had gone into a studio in sec in Reno. It's just a four track studio. It was really didn't sound very good. And uh, we recorded eighteen songs. And uh, again, you know, Ian McKay kept saying, "Put it out on your own. Put it out on your own." I was like, oh, "Maybe we will." But then uh, uh, Jello had expressed interest in releasing the entire record and so we had a title i had the cover done it was called united we stand it was like we're making our big statement this is our debut album and and um their deal their distribution deal went bad and they they had money that was owed to them and he said well we can do it but we can't do it meanwhile we we're playing all over the west coast and playing you know we started to really play so it, we, we didn't really quite know what to do and then i got a letter from sean stern and he said hey a uh, couple things we wanted to ask if you guys seven seconds want to come down and play la Back when the, that's back when the, what's the place called the Mad not Mad Gardens. They had they were they were doing a Godzilla's. They they were doing some shows, and they were booking like angelic upstarts with wasted youth and all these things. Yeah. And so we're like, yeah, we'd love to. So he said, all right, well we're you know we got we can get, how about we do a weekend? We'll book you two shows, and, and also you know would would you be interested in doing a you know the album on BYO? And we are you know I love to you know, the first compilation and Youth Brigade stuff. So we were, we were pretty psyched about that. And we thought, yeah, sure, of course. <laughs> it was all, you know, yeah, bro stuff, you know, like, yeah, sure, we'll do your record. So we went down on a weekend. Her show was in somewhere in Hollywood and we opened for Socialist. No, first show was in uh, Santa Ana. We opened for Suicidal Tendencies, Wasted Youth, somebody else, somebody else. And then the second night was with um, and some ballroom with Social Distortion and a bunch of bands. I, we, we couldn't have asked for two better debut shows. And right from the start, the kids were excited. They were going nuts. It was scary. There was like three pits going on at once. And we were watching kids, you know, pick each other up and then beat the shit out of each other. We just saw everything that in those that weekend. So, um, and we did a flip side. We did a flip side interview. It was like, you know, we had kind of like, oh, we've arrived, you know, and everybody was really nice and, and supportive. And uh, the Stearns took care of us. You know, we stayed with them and, and we were in town and they'd take us to cool restaurants and take us to Melrose back when it was cool to go down to Melrose and get gawked at by the tourists and whatever. But yeah, it was all really sort of a magical little time, you know. We, we were just kind of following along and doing whatever, <laughs> you know, doing it because it that's what we wanted. And, you know, we, we, we were kind of blown away by all of how it all, you know, transpired, really. It's amazing you think yeah. about it now. I and, mean, yeah. you know, so let's look at the album. You know, The Crew is such a great record in 18 songs, you yeah. know. And um, one of the songs I want to talk about is, is Trust because it ends the album, right? And, but it's... Truly, up until that time, in the hardcore scene, I mean, certainly in the other original punk scene, you had the Buzzcocks who would write some songs yeah. that were about relationships, but you were the first hardcore band 
to do that. that you guys, that was groundbreaking mm-hmm. for a band to write something, uh, uh, but it's basically a love song, right? With trust. Sure. So a lot of people say you're the first emo band coming out of the hardcore <laughs> scene, right? I'm out of here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, right? But it's Maybe been... For it's a, yeah. no, no, right? But I mean, so it's a great song. Thanks. Talk to me about that. I mean, because for me, for you to do that at that period of time was saying, you know, no, there were no boundaries. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna do the kind of song that you want to do. Talk to me about that. I just, you know, I just realized early on that I wasn't much of a tough guy. I wanted to be one. I wanted, you know, I liked the, the, the I, I had anger and I had this, this, this desire to destroy stuff. But I also knew that I, you know, I was really tight with my mom and I, I watched her go through so much just to keep our family together and, and people that were around, you know, I, we just, when you grow up in like, shitty apartment complexes, you see all, everybody else is kind of going through the same thing. And I remember thinking it was important to sort of come to terms with my own sensitivity, if you will, and just, just kind of keep maintaining that humanity. I, I just didn't know better, uh, I think, when it came to, when I was starting to understand how to write songs, I just, I was like, I'm just gonna spew it out there, and then if, it, if people like it, if they re- relate, that's cool, I hope they do, but, you know, I grew up in a generation, you know, I, my generation was like, the way that you proved that you were a guy, a, a, guy, a man was to kind of like, it was cool to be abusive to women. It was okay to be macho and a dickhead and, and selfish. And I was like, it's not really my thing. I just don't feel that way. I don't know what that makes me, but I just don't, I don't relate to it. And so uh, I just took however I felt and tried to put it in, the, in songs. And Trust was one of those songs. And, and it brings me to another song, Not Just Boys Fun, because again, you from the very beginning were supportive, like more people should be, right? And and, yeah, and it should have been at that time. But I thought that was also sadly way ahead of its time. But it was cool, right? So, sure, yeah. talk, so talk to me about that song. Uh, again, it goes back to just having being lucky enough to have a few really strong, independent women in my life that that, that just inspired me. And, and and also like I think the early scene, we just had like there were a lot of women involved. My sister was really a, a mover. She would, she did fanzines and she she was just very. She didn't take any shit, you know. She she wanted to play punk rock, and when she, people told her she can't play guitar, you know, you, maybe you can play bass, and she taught herself how to play guitar. And, and also, I just didn't want women uh, alienated at our shows. I liked that a lot of girls came to our shows. I wanted. I wanted that to keep, I like looking out and seeing everybody, you know, and it made me feel good and seeing girls get up and stage dive and, and a girl grab my mic and sing with me. I was like, I like all that stuff. So it just, it just, uh, I felt like if, if we can call attention to it and say it's, it's a cool thing, maybe it'll keep going, you know? So yeah. I think that's really what it, what it came down to. Yeah. Um, I've never been comfortable with having just a bunch of sweaty dudes rubbing yeah. all rubbing against each other and going, you know, yeah, like a, <laughs> fast, right? yeah, yeah, you know, it's like I like it a little more balanced, I think, yeah. I mean, just in general, you know. Now, one of your most famous songs and most loved is uh, definitely "Young Till I Die," and uh, there's a great story. Like the great thing about this reissue too is just, uh, you know, I love the the booklet inside, and you know, what Trust has been doing. Yeah. for the history of punk and hardcore is just so cool. I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I love that uh, in there, you know, that you talk about, there's a story, and I love this, you wrote those lyrics on the back of a keynote card. Tell yeah. Me, <laughs> tell me, paint that picture for me. Like, where were you, what were you doing at that very point? Go, it goes back to what I was saying earlier about, you know, you be, be sort of, I, I started to work in the gaming industry because they were easy jobs to get. And I remember working as a, uh, they, they call it, I was a change person at, at Cal Neva Casino. And basically what I did is I walked around with this huge apron filled with rolls of coins, quarters and dimes. And my job for eight hours a day was just to walk around this area, casinos, and these old ladies would jab me with their $20 and give me some change, give me some change. And everybody was miserable because they were losing and just they'd been drinking too much and smoking. And it was just, it, there are times I thought I was losing my mind. I was just like, this can't be my life. This can't be, I, I have, there's got to be more than this. And so what would get me is just, I would, I, again, that having that soundtrack in my head of this, just this music that just lifted me up, but also just, uh, I was now in this mode of like wanting to write songs for my new ba- punk band. And uh, so back then they'd have the keynote tickets. They didn't put anything on the back. Now there's printed stuff. So, but we used, I used to grab a handful and keep in my apron and then I just tuck away in a corner and I'd have some ideas for a lyric. And the crew album, 
the majority of the lyrics really were written on on the back of those dumb keys. I wish I had those actually. It'd be kind of fun to see what, how they how the lyrics change, you know. But I think it's brilliant because you know, like it's amazing when you think about those jobs that you have when you're when you're young, when you're yeah. a teenager. Because I also had a fast food job. Yep. Did all kinds of things like so I can relate to that. Yeah. It, well, I, sh shortly thereafter, I got a job as a cab driver, and I would throw my guitar in the back of the, the, the trunk, and I would go tuck away somewhere, and the, the dispatcher would be like, you know, Rick Carr, blah blah, where are you at? And I'd, I'd you know, I'd tell him, oh, I was taking a piss, whatever. But I'd be in there, I'd have my guitar, and I was like writing chords down. And yeah. I was just like, yeah. I mean, I, it was really an early sign that maybe you just should just get out of this whole thing and just try and be poor, be hungry, but just get in, get the band going, and try to try, try to get on the road more often and stuff. So that's. Tell me about that first tour. 84 you know what I mean and uh, that, that, so 84 give me some stories from what what that was like again you guys really worked so hard for everything you had because you guys nothing was handed to you you guys were, were poor guys you but you made something out of it yourself you and your sister and Steve yeah talk to me about to. that we, uh, we we had toured all up and down the West Coast a bunch of times, played everywhere, and we just knew we had to get on the road. And at that by that point, we had made you know, there was a great network on the underground scene. I mean, you had you know uh, if you wanted to play in the Detroit Midwest, you got a hold of Barry from the Necros. If you wanted to play, you know. Uh, Austin, Texas, talk to Tim or, or Chris or, or Biscuit from Big Boys. Everybody, there were just key people in every city and, and everybody knew each other at that point. It was all letters and postcards and phone calls. And um, I just said, screw it. Let's just, let's, let's plot out two months. We have this new album. It, the album, the crew was, at, it was happening. The EPs were doing really well. We, we had already really started a headline in, in LA and San Francisco. And I said, it's time. We got to get on the road. Everybody's like out there. But I mean, the minute we were out there, we knew we were, we. We were in the, on the right track. That's yeah. great. Yeah, That's yeah, yeah. It was a lot of a lot of fun. What was it like when you finally like, met Ian? Because you know you were obviously were somebody you looked up to him in Minor Threat and you guys. And he was a guy who obviously loved the band. He was a big fan of you guys. Mm -hmm. yeah, we we were just pen pals. Uh, first, we were pen pals with Henry. Henry had gotten our first demo tape from Biafra, and then Henry wrote. I still have the letter, and he's just said, "Hey, you know, that when he was Henry Garfield." Yeah. And he was just like, "Hey, I, I got the demo." Here's our, here's the R7 inch. It was he had his band SOA and set that, and then we started being pin pals. And then he Ian wrote us a letter and said, uh, "Hey, I liked your your demo, and here's a here's some stuff I do." And it was like the first three Discord records, you know. Yeah. And then that was it. I mean, Ian was always he, Ian was great because my sister did a fanzine. He would send out all the Discord stuff to my sister, and he was really kind. And and Ian was just. I think, you know, he's a year younger than me, but we just always connected in a lot of ways. Just we'd talk, have great discussions about stuff, and uh, we, lo we just loved Minor Threat. We, when they were starting to come out to the West Coast, we, we, we were like, you have to play Reno, don't skip Reno, you know? And so they did, they played tw twice in Reno, and the first time they played in the backyard, my friend's backyard, because we couldn't find a club, and I just thought it was cool that the Minor Threat guys said, yeah, we'll play, we don't care, so yeah. yeah. But that, you know, just that independent thing, the, the way he was, he was just running pit Discord records and he was so helpful about how to do that, just even how to go to a pressing plant and get stuff pressed. And, and that was really, really huge for us at the time. And um, yeah, just he's been a friend for life, really. You know, we talk on the phone every once in a while and it's just like the same, same, same thing, you know. So That's he's been cool. a good guy. It's great that you still have all those friendships with all those people yeah. you met. And, because, you know, back in that day, you know, because you and I are the same age, it's like, you know, when you found your people, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. They were your, they were your, your tribe, you know. <laughs> you, you, it, I knew it was there somewhere. I just, you know, I just had to go looking for it. And, and uh, I mean, I say to this day, the best part of being in, in this band and being a part of this is just the amount of amazing people we've met, you know. And even we'd be the band that, you know, these young kids would come and see, and, and they loved the band, and we became friends with them and so many people have gone on to become just amazing doctors and lawyers and you know filmmakers and you know I mean it's it's insane how the reach of hardcore is is, is it seeped into everything you know yeah. fashion and everything it's just it's it's a part of it you know and and uh, you know it's 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 a nice thing to be a part of still you know yeah I mean I'm I, I I can't say that I regret any of it. I think it's all been great, you know. I think it's great. I mean, you've been such an influential band, and it's and but but so many great records. Thank you. Looking back, right now on the crew, um, can you tell us any other stories about? Just, just tell me about the the recording sessions based around mm -hmm. the record. That was such a blur because we had never really been in in a an actual recording studio. We'd always recorded at our buddy's house in this four track, 
And so going into the studio for the first time, it was very professional and there was money, there was a budget. And the guy that engineered the record was kind of a more of a rock, he'd done some, he did engineer some rock records, some heavy, like heavy metal records and stuff. This guy Brad, he was really cool, really kind of en- tons of energy and just kind of worked with us really well. But we had no idea what we were doing. I didn't have any, I didn't really know what, uh, anything I didn't know my way around a recording studio like I've, I've learned how to do things now and I, I have more confidence and I know how to say no I don't like that we're gonna do this but back then I was just like terrified you know I was like yeah. well I guess he knows what he's doing but the fun part was that we did it really quickly all of our friends we invited our friends to come in and sing on the record and they all came in and, and by the time we were done I, I you know I remember listening to the, the I had a tape of it and I got went home back to Reno I had I had to go to work that next you know following week and I remember just I couldn't think straight I was just like Wow, we made an album, you know, like, what does that mean? What are we going to do now? You know, and it was it was pretty exciting and scary at the same time. And, and how long did it take you to record the 18 songs? Not long. I, th- I want to say we did it in, like, at least the recording part was maybe two or three sessions. It yeah. wasn't it wasn't a lot. I I mean, there was a budget to where we couldn't spend weeks doing it. I know that. But uh, it wasn't long. It was just a matter of days. Yeah. Days and... and you can kind of tell, you know. You can, well, there's an urgency in the yeah. sound of it. You know what <laughs> it's I mean, like, right? one, two, one, two, three, four. <laughs> one, two, one, two, three. You know, it sounded like we just wanted to get in there and get out of there before it started costing anybody money. Yeah, it's amazing. So, is there anything you'd like to say? I mean, looking now, here we are, almost 40 years on yeah, right? yeah, from the nuts. album. What, what is something that you'd like to say when you reflect back on that record? Uh, man, yeah, I mean, it was the record that really kind of put us on the map in terms of en- enabling us to become a, a full touring act and and on a national level and even international level, you know, it, it, it opened people up to the band, which was great. Um, I'm, I'm really proud of it. I love the record. I love the songs. You know, I still don't, I don't listen, like, sit and listen to it all the time, but when I do hear those songs, I, I just, I love it. I smile, you know. It's yeah. like a, it, there's a lot of meaning behind every song. Um, and it's weird because when we first started talking with Trust about this, I, I, I you know, I was like, it, it, we're at a point now where a lot of our records are so old and, you know, some of them are out of print. And it's like, I don't, you know, I just, before I die, I just want the songs, I want them available. I want everything yeah. up there so that people can hear them if they want to hear them. And so I'm pretty, I'm very excited about it. I'm, I'm stoked that the, the remasters, it all sounds great. And, and just having, I mean, the booklet and seeing all the really cool things people said about the band, people I yeah. wouldn't have any, I had to have no idea you even knew who we were, you know, like there's yeah. people that have stepped up and said, oh yeah, I, I love the record, you know, and that's, that's pretty, it's, 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 it's really touching and, and it means a lot to us. And I don't know, pretty excited about it. I, I, that's about all I can say. It'd yeah. be interesting to see how it how it flies, you know. So. Uh, I think it's going to do great. It's, Thank a, it's you. a fantastic yeah. album. I'm so it's awesome that it's going to see the light of day again. Yeah, I think so and too. Great pressing and just like getting the attention it deserves. I'm one of those low expectation having kind of guys, so everything just seems like a really fun, happy surprise. You yeah. know, like <laughs> that is great. Well, I finally get to meet you, and it was awesome. Yeah, it's it great was talking with you. Yeah. Yeah. It was it was amazing. Thank you, Kevin. Seconds for the release of the crew on Trust Records. Thanks so much for hanging out with us.